Our Sunday School lesson this week is titled Daniel Sees Future Kingdoms, coming from the selected scripture of the eighth chapter of Daniel, starting there at the 19th verse and going through the 26th verse. Our lesson this week, it takes a look at another vision of Daniel, the vision of the ram and goat. In comparison to our Sunday School lesson last week, where we took a look at the vision that Daniel had about the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man, even the little horn, the four beasts as well. The vision that we take a look at in our lesson this week is one that in a manner of speaking has been fulfilled as we will see here today. But also there is an implication that we'll see here in our Sunday school lesson of one who is coming. And so I will say this before I even jump into the selected scripture of today's lesson. If you missed my sermon from last week, where again, I preached about being onward to victory. If you did not watch, if you did not listen to that sermon, I would highly recommend you, after, after watching this lesson or listening to this lesson, go back and, and watch last week or listen to last week's sermon because the one who we will mention here in our Sunday School lesson today, I dove much deeper into in my sermon last week. So again, I would highly, I would highly recommend that as well. Now, giving understanding of this vision to Daniel is the angel mentioned there in the 16th verse, Gabriel. This is actually Gabriel's first mention in scripture. We see him later in New Testament scripture, specifically uh, before the birth of Christ, when Gabriel came to Mary and, and spoke to Mary about her giving birth to Christ. So this again, I want you to understand Daniel, he struggled to understand this vision as we saw in our Sunday school lesson last week and in my sermon that I preached last week. And so he needed more clarity, he needed more understanding. And it is Gabriel who the Lord sent to Daniel to give him clarity and to give him understanding. And as I said in my sermon last week, I want to say to all of you today as well, when God shows you something that you may not understand, when, when a message is presented to you, that you may not understand. Never be afraid, never be ashamed to, to ask questions, to seek clarity, to seek understanding from the Lord. The Lord, he gives you a message because he wants you to know. And so if you're struggling, if, you, if you're having a problem with understanding God's message, seek clarity, seek understanding, seek him. So Gabriel, he tells Daniel in the opening scripture of our lesson uh, for this week, I am making known to you what will happen in the latter time of indignation. The latter time of indignation specifically being pointed out there. It points back, if you take a look at the 13th verse there, it points back to where Daniel, he saw holy ones speaking concerning the timing of the daily sacrifices, the timing of the transgression of desolation. Very important to highlight that as well. And the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. That's the indignation that is being spoken of there. The timing, essentially setting the place of, of this vision when the things of this vision would literally take place. And the holy ones, when they were talking about it, they said that 2,300 days, then the sanctuary would be cleansed. Again, setting the timing of the, the indignation and then the latter times of the indignation for again, when this vision, when it would take place. If you've ever read the Maccabees, then you've probably seen and heard this name before. You've probably also read about the desolation of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a, a very wicked, a very evil man that had it out for the Jews. He, he desecrated the temple and he desecrated the temple by offering up offerings to, to Jupiter, who was essentially the Roman version of the Greek god Zeus. He went into the temple and he made sacrifices in God's temple, the temple that was built for the Lord, the temple that would hold the Ark of the Covenant, right? The temple where again, the Lord was served, where the Lord was worshiped. And this evil and this wicked man, he went into the temple and he offered up offerings to, to these false and these idol gods. And so the Maccabean revolt, again, if you've ever read the book of the Maccabees, 
that revolt against this wicked and this evil man is what gave way to the holiday that's still celebrated to this day. It gave birth to, to Hanukkah, okay? So Gabriel, he makes this vision, he makes this timing, he makes it well more clear uh, for Daniel when we take a look at the 20th verse where Gabriel, he explains in that verse what the ram and, and what the goat, what they represented. He said there in that verse that the ram, that it represented the kings of the Meds and, and Persia. When we take a look at the 21st verse there, Gabriel, he explained that the goat represented the kingdom of Greece with the large horn between the goat's eyes being representing its first king, the first king of Greece being Alexander the Great, probably a name that you have heard before. Now, if you take a look back at the fifth verse, again, taking a look at Daniel's vision, the goat, the scripture tells us there, it came up sudden and it went across the earth, the scripture says, without touching the ground. Now, that does not speak to Greece having an airplane and moving across the surface by being able to fly. That's not what that scripture is saying there. But what it does speak to is how swift Alexander the Great could move the army of Greece. It is said that Alexander the Great is one of the greatest military tacticians that has ever graced, that has ever walked the earth and how he could move his army from one position to another position. And, and not only could he move his army with great swiftness, but he could not be stopped. He, he could not be defeated. When he would come across a kingdom, when he come, would come across an army, he would defeat them. Alexander the Great, under, under Greece under his rule, was very powerful. It was a very powerful kingdom. It came up ac across Persia and it defeated the Persians. It defeated the same Persians that ran across the Babylonians and, and the Persians, they defeated Bab the Babylonians. Those same Babylonians who came across the land of Judea and conquered Judea, who had went through and, and ransacked the, the temple, the same temple that again, we'll see here that this future man, Antiochus Epiphanes, who he would come across and he would desecrate the temple. So Gabriel again, he is setting the timing of, of again, the latter time of the indignation where, where this man would rise up that is being spoken of there. We'll see there in the 22nd verse that Gabriel, he points out about the large horn there. He said that the large horn, that it would be broken, that it was broken. And again, this, it speaks to Alexander the Great. It speaks to his sudden death. It is said that Alexander the Great, some say that, that he died because he got bored. Some say that he died because he was poisoned. Others said that he died because he was, that he was a drunk. Now, again, if we take a look at that verse there, that 22nd verse, Gabriel explains there that the breaking of the little, the, the big horn, the large horn, I should say there, that Alexander the Great's death, that it would give way to four kingdoms rising out of Greece. But Gabriel said those kingdoms, they would rise, but they wouldn't have, they wouldn't quite have the same power uh, as Alexander the Great had. And so it was in the latter time of those kingdoms, Gabriel says there in the 23rd verse, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, he explained that this king would rise. And again, this is Antiochus Epiphanes. And a description is given there in that 23rd verse of the features of, of this man. And so Gabriel, he points out there in the 24th verse that his power shall be not of his own power. His power and his might would not be of his own. There are stories about this Antiochus Epiphanes, this Antiochus the Mad, that suggest that he may have had some kind of supernatural power. It was not an, an ordinary power, not a power that was of this world. And Gabriel's word here certainly suggests those possibilities to certainly be true. And so with his power, Gabriel explained that he would destroy fearfully, that he would prosper, that he would thrive. He would destroy the mighty and also the holy people. The holy people being spoken of there, 
being the Jews. The Jews, again, they lived under severe threat of this Antiochus Epiphanes. They lived under severe threat, lived under severe danger, lived under severe attack from this wicked man. And so Gabriel, there in the 25th verse, Gabriel said that that man that, again, we know to be Antiochus would be cunning, that he would cause deceit to prosper under his rule, deceit, prospering under his rule. And again, if you aren't already paying any attention to the descriptions of, of this person, this man that, that Gabriel is speaking of here, I again want you to pay close attention to these words. Antiochus, Gabriel explains here, would exalt himself in his heart and destroy many in their prosperity. And even more here, Gabriel explains here that this person, Antiochus, would even rise against the princes of princes. Who do you think that that is speaking of? Who is this person that would stand up against the princes of princes? Anytime we see that in scripture, who is that speaking of? We would say, well, that's speaking against Christ. But Christ, Christ doesn't exist at that period in time, not in the world. The Son certainly exists. Again, John wrote that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among people. So again, we know that the Word being God and the Word being made flesh speaks to Christ. But again, Christ wasn't physically in the world at that period of time. So who could the Prince of Princes be? It can mean none other than God himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It can be none other than, than God himself. And so this man would raise himself up there. The scripture says there, he will raise himself up to stand against God. And again, I say to you that if you watch my sermon, if you listen to my sermon last week, this description, it should remind you of the Antichrist. And again, I say to you, if you didn't watch that sermon from last week, if you did not listen to that sermon last week, if you didn't read it, I'd again would highly suggest go back, watch, listen, and read my sermon from last week. This again is a description that makes implication of the Antichrist, who Paul wrote of in the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. Let's take a look at what Paul said there in the fourth verse of the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, where Paul said that the lawless one, the man of sin, the one that we call the Antichrist, will oppose, will exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, I wanna be very clear about this, okay? Antiochus, he's lived well before us, right? He's lived well before our time. The one that Paul speaks of in the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians will not appear until a certain fall, falling away occurs. And the falling away that occurs will be the falling away of faith in the Lord. That won't happen until the church is removed from the world. The church will be removed from the world. And when I say the church, I wanna be very clear about this. I'm talking about all of those who are of sincere faith, all of those who walk by faith. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about those who sincerely believe in the Lord and his only begotten son. We will be removed from this world, not by the hands of man, but because Christ will come again and receive us to himself. As he says in the 14th chapter of John's gospel, when the sincere believer is removed from this world, it will give way to a period of time that Jesus said will be tribulation in the world like that has never been seen before. We call that the great tribulation. And it's during that day when the Antichrist will rise in the world. Antiochus Epiphanes, he's merely an implication of what the Antichrist will be like. And again, I will give you all of you some homework again to watch my sermon from last week because I dove more into the second chapter of second Thessalonians to where we see the things that the, the person of Antichrist 
will come in this world and will actually do. Antiochus, he did some of those things, but again, he's not the Antichrist. He's merely a form of Antichrist. He's of the spirit of Antichrist, which shows us again, and I said this in my sermon last week, the spirit of Antichrist has already been in the world. We can go all the way back. We can trace it all the way back to Antiochus. The spirit of Antichrist, it is anti-God, meaning that it is anti-love. That spirit, it is in the world today. And again, I suggest all of you, you go and watch my sermon from last week. Listen to my sermon from last week, because I certainly, I spoke a great deal of that as well. So the spirit of Antichrist is in the world today. We can trace it all the way back to Antiochus, who was a man who was against God. He, as the scripture says there, he stood against God. Quite terrifying how wicked and how evil this man, how evil and wicked this man was, especially for those who lived during the, the, that time period. The Jews of that day, they caught it. They, did, they really did caught it, uh, catch it. But when we take a look at the 25th verse there, as terrifying as that vision had to sound and, and be for Daniel, Gabriel, he points out there in the 25th verse that that king, that future king, Antiochus, would be broken without human means. It is said in the Maccabees, because this speaks about, this speaks about uh, Antiochus, his death. And so it's said in, in the Maccabees that Antiochus Epiphanes had worms rise out of his body and his flesh that it rotted away in a foul stench. Now, not to get into uh, medical speech here, we know that it is possible for worms to, and this is gonna sound kind of nasty, to develop in the body. For example, we know that dogs, that they can de uh, develop worms, that's why uh, you would give them something that would help uh, deworm them uh, because if that develops in dogs, it, it certainly can can kill them. It can also, worms can also form in humans as well. And again, it can certainly, they can certainly kill. Uh, we see it here again with Antiochus. It, it, it is believed that that's what happened with Antiochus. In fact, in scripture, it happened to another man. It happened to Herod, uh, the king who tried to kill all of the baby boys when, uh, when Jesus, when when he was born. So he, Herod, he died a, a very similar death uh, as scripture points out as well. So something that I do want to, to point out about that, again, is something that I said in my sermon last week. We may live in some terrible times with, with the wicked and the evil, but again, God will not allow us to be defeated. I said that a couple of Sundays ago. And as I said in my sermon last week, we will have the victory over the wicked and over the evil. So Gabriel, he said there in the 26th verse, in conclusion there, that the vision of the evenings and mornings which were told, they are true. And again, the reason why they are true is because guess who they came from? Who did Daniel's visions, who did they come from? They came from the Lord, right? And so because they came from God, and again, because God is sending his messenger angel to interpret uh, these visions for Daniel, we know that they are true. And so we should take them as truth, right? It's a vision that, that certainly was filled, okay? It happened, we can go back and look at history to see where it, where it happened. But again, the implication, what it implies is that there is one who's going to come, as scripture shows us, who is going to come in such manner of wickedness, who is going to come in such manner of evil. And as I asked in my sermon last week, should we be fearful of the wicked? Should we be fearful of the evil? Should we be afraid of them? In other words, should we be anxious about their doings? Should we be worried about the possibility of, of us facing harm, hurt, danger from the wicked and, and from the evil. It, it's, again, it's part of our nature to certainly to worry about what the wicked and, and what the evil, what they are up to, potentially being harmed by, by the wicked and by the evil. But again, we should again have faith. 
These visions that Daniel has received from the Lord, they weren't given to him for him to be fearful. They weren't given to him to be terrified of what the wicked and what the evil would be, what they would be up to and what they would do. They were given to him essentially to prepare. Okay, they were given to him to share with the people so that they could be prepared. And as I said in my sermon last week, when we know that there is a storm that's coming and we can get prepared for it, we put ourselves in a better position of being able to withstand, being able to survive, being able to overcome that storm. And so again, that's what the word of God is for us. We have the word of God. We have the future visions that has again been revealed to us by Christ himself so that we can get ourselves ready, so that we can be prepared, so that we don't worry about the, 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 the evil and the wicked, what they are up to today. We, we ought not ever fear them because again, we know that God is on our side. And again, we know that God will not allow us to be destroyed. So that's something that I want you to take away from, from our lesson today. The word of God, it is true. It has come from the Lord and we should walk by faith in the word of God. When we do that, we overcome the wicked, we overcome the evil. Hey there, thanks for watching this week's Sunday School lesson. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I hope that you'll share this lesson with someone somewhere. And if you have any questions, if you have any comments, don't be afraid to leave a question. Don't be afraid to leave a comment as well. And again, if you aren't doing so already, make sure that you're following the New Found Faith channel. Make sure you hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any of our wonderful videos that we have here on our YouTube page.